Hey, welcome back. This week we're talking about the geology of the Reveille Range area. It's an area I really like. Not many people around, as you can see there. Well, our little alien friend is back up there in the corner. This is the northern Reveille Range looking north. The Pancake Range in the immediate foreground here. And then in the very far background, uh, a different range, which I do not remember the name of. Anyway, this is looking north, so this means this shot was taken very early in the morning as the sun was rising in the east, casting the shadows to the west. So this week, as a model you've gotten used to over the last few weeks, we're going to discuss where the Reveille Range is located, both geographically and geologically. Provide a succinct overview of the ages and distribution of the rock units and take a quick tour of some of the geological highlights. Well, the Rivoli Range is located in central Nevada, and I mean central, in the center of the basin and range. It's located far from any population center, and it's not located on any major highway. And by major highway, I mean connecting two uh, points that you would find humans traveling regularly. So, you know, this class is called the geology of the southwestern U.S. and not the geology of the Colorado Plateau, so it is indeed time for us to move west, finally. We've been over here on the plateau or the edge of the plateau for quite some time. And now we are sitting here clearly in the center, right, of this basin and range province with all of these north to northeast trending ranges. As far as the geography and the road layout, I've got the Reveille Range circled here. This is Highway 375 um, coming off of the biggest highway in the area would be Highway 93. So if you're going to go from Las Vegas north to Idaho, there's two ways to go. You can either run up I-15, which is a little faster, which takes you way east and out of the way, but then it comes back again. Or you can go north on Highway 93. Highway 93 will eventually run you into towns like Wells. So uh, maybe that's not a major highway to you. Um, the other place uh, is the typical highway. The highway with the most traffic is Highway 95, which runs from Las Vegas along the western side of Nevada to the town of Tonopah. It continues north, and ultimately this is how you get to Reno. So the highway that the Reveille Range is located on is Highway 375, which has been renamed the Extraterrestrial Highway. And here's our alien friend back again. And the reason it's called the Extraterrestrial Highway, and I'll show you this on another document or a diagram in a minute, is to the south of Highway 375 is the Nevada Test Site and the Tonopah Test Range. Um, test Range was an extension of the uh, bombing and gunnery range for the U.S. Air Force. And then in the 1940s, when they needed a place to test atomic bombs, this was the area that was chosen. So Highway 95 borders it on the south, Highway 93 on the east, Highway 375 in the north. So this highway, Highway 375, is uh, heading from like Alamo to uh, Warm Springs. Not many people go this way. And in fact, that highway was developed to bring men materials, supplies, and infrastructure into the northern part of the Nevada test site. And it's up here in about this corner right there, which is Area 51, as I'll point out to you um, in a second. Okay? So I like to say it's about as far as you can get from humans um, in the lower 48 because it's a big, vast area that's not traveled frequently and it's bordered to the south by an area that's uh, as off limits as any place in the world. Okay, so to get to the Reveille Range from Zion, because remember the last place we will have been was Zion National Park, 
we come out of Zion um, on, a, on the western entrance and we end up over here on I-15 eventually north of St. George. We drive for about 30-40 oh, minutes whoops and 30-40 uh, minutes and we get up here to the town of Cedar City. There uh, we head west and we take off and I've kind of approximated the road here on the one side. But anyway, we take off across the Basin and Range province. We are fully in the Basin and Range once we leave Cedar City. And eventually we link up with Highway 375. And that uh, once here when we get off of Highway, this is 93 heading down to Las Vegas. And there's 95 heading from Las Vegas to Reno. And of course, this then is the Nevada test site. And if we were to zoom in, you could actually see from this photo evidence of atomic blasting. Also down here is, I'll show you later uh, in the lecture, these little black dots down here are young volcanoes. Well, the Reveille Range lies up here, and, um, and then again, let's see the next diagram. If we continue from the Reveille Range, uh, after we stop there, we'll continue on to Mammoth, which is about the same distance as we traveled from Cedar City. Like I said in the earlier slide, about 250 miles or so. So, let's see. Uh, yeah, after we visit, so next week we'll talk about this region over here, the Long Valley Mammoth area. Um, and then uh, ultimately our last discussion will take place on the region around Death Valley, and then we'll return to Las Vegas. Okay, well, the, 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 the interesting aspect, the cultural aspect of the Reveille Range, other than ranching, is the uh, proximity to Area 51, made famous in the movie Independence Day, and of course, if you're a conspiracy theorist, this is where the uh, uh, they got the aliens and the alien spaceships after they landed at Roswell, New Mexico. Um, so this is a little town here. This is these these are our crop circles. These are these large irrigated areas that are done through groundwater. So each one of these is a very large circle all connected together. But south of this dry lake bed is this little teeny town of Rachel. And that's on Highway 375, which again was renamed the Extraterrestrial Highway. And we will stop there at the Little Ailey Inn. Um, get it? Yes. Anyway, uh, it's a cute little bar and grill there that used to be called the Rachel Bar and Grill when I worked out here. But they've capitalized on the, uh, the, the, you know, the Area 51. Anyway, this is Area 51 down here. This is Groom Lake. And if you were to zoom in on uh, Google Earth, you will notice that there is a runway and a bunch of facilities out here. This is a top secret test base. Um, that is used, oh, it's been used as far back as into the 40s for the U-2 spy plane, the, uh, the uh, SR-71 spy plane, the original stealth fighter. All of these were test flown and operated out of this Groom Lake facility, again, which is surrounded by the Nevada test site. And um, the closest you can get is try to hike up into these mountains and have a peak downward. It doesn't usually end up successfully. But anyway, here's our Reveille range, so we're very close, right? So the range itself, if you look at the length of the range, it's about that much longer. You could be down here in this top secret area. So most of the people you find out in this part of the world will either be government contractors, uh, military personnel, or the local ranchers. All right, so now how about some geology? Well, the Reveille Range is located in the center of the Basin Range, and man, we have been over how, when, and why this extension began in the part of the, was part of the world. I hope you remember, right? The changing uh, tectonic picture out in the Pacific, which ended the compression and began the extension when that section of the uh, Farallon Plate was subducted. And the basin and range has been pulling apart since the sort of mid part of the Cenozoic. And we see here this, the stable Sierra Nevada block on the western side, and then these tilted fault blocks with Listric normal faulting. So the ranges actually get tilted, um, um, not 
down drop like the original idea of horse and robins. Anyway, over here on the west, on the eastern side would be the area around Zion um, and Cedar City with the Wasatch Mountain Range. So associated with the thinning is the upwelling of mantle, and that upwelling of mantle creates a decompression, and that decompression promotes melting. So along with the extension and thinning is higher heat flow and melting. Of course, you remember all of this, don't you? I've shown you this before, a, a kind of a somewhat grainy photo, but showing this, this tilted mountain ranges. Each one of these, you can see that there are strata. Now, that could be sedimentary rocks, the older Paleozoic and Mesozoic sedimentary rocks in many parts of the Basin Range, or in the area we're going to go, uh, as you'll see in a minute, these will likely be ignimbrites, ash flow tufts. So taking a look at our geologic time scale, uh, always remembering where we are and what rocks will be here, of course this area of the central part of Nevada experienced sedimentation right all through the Paleozoic and those limestones and various terrestrial rocks are there just like they're there in the Grand Canyon just like they're there in the area around Las Vegas. Then of course in the Mesozoic we have more sedimentation but we start to get the severe orogeny and the squeezing and the thrust faulting and the associated sedimentary rocks as well. Well the part that we're interested in in the central part of Nevada where we are now is of course we're going to have those older Paleozoic and Mesozoic rocks thrust faulted like we see around Las Vegas but this is the big change okay so 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 the name the name of the game in this part of the world as I say up there is ash flow tufts or another word for them are ignimbrites and there's this ignimbrite flare-up that takes place between about 30 and 20 million years ago in this part of the world which covers the landscape in thick ash flow tufts. And an ash flow tuff is just ash, just a huge deposit right, of um, ash laid down by these very explosive uh, silicic volcanic eruptions. So the ignimbrite flare-up, it laid down a wide swath of ash flow tufts across the basin and range between about 31 and 20 million years ago. There are over 70 known volcanic centers, that means like calderas, right? and over a hundred separate tuff units that have been recognized. Now some of these tufts, believe it or not, exceed a thousand cubic kilometers in volume. And just to show you in a, 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 a sort of a landmark that most people would understand is when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, the amount that that explosive eruption produced one cubic kilometer. So you can imagine a thousand cubic kilometers. So here laid out from, this is not Colorado, this is Utah, but this is the Colorado Plateau. Over here, there's a uh, Marysville uh, a volcanic field, which has some extensive ash flow tufts. I just drove through them going to Moab from St. George. But the area we're going to be traveling in, north of St. George, Zion is about here. So as soon as we get west of Zion, we enter this area of ash flow tufts and what you see the different colors are different aged units um, um, silicic ignimbrites we see here and acidic ignimbrites and lavas so all of this area is experiencing explosive volcanism and you can see various caldera margins and outlines and actually we will be right in the center of this in the Reveille range so here's another example Another figure from a paper somewhere superimposed on top of a digital elevation model, right? This is uh, uh, Lake Tahoe over here. Um, Mammoth is right around here somewhere. And we're going to be leaving Cedar City. I took the same road from the earlier diagram and kind of, it doesn't perfectly overlay because it's a different uh, projection, this map. But anyway, you can see how we're going to be traveling west along the road and we're going to be deep into the middle of all these ash flow tufts. And then we're going to come up here and we're going to end up staying. The Reveille Range is right about here and you can see right in the heart of all of these caldera systems, right? Um, pretty amazing. Anyway, 
lots and lots of ash flow tufts everywhere you look. Now, I'm not going to talk about ash flow tufts and their deposition and the types of features that we'll see this week because next week we're talking about Long Valley caldera and Long Valley caldera is a modern caldera with some very recent eruptions, the last one being 79,000 years ago. Uh, and that's where we'll get into the, the, the details of caldera eruptions and the formation of ash flow tufts in the various units. So hang on another week. Well, when we finally get to the Reveille range, and over on the left you see a, uh, a, a, an image from Google Earth of the entire range, and of course these black scab-like patches are the young basalts. And um, uh, the, the southern part of the range doesn't have a lot of this, but what you can see beautifully in this picture is this range-bounding fault. And this, of course, means that this range is actively still tilting and faulting. Over to the west, this is the Kaywich Range, and it also shows a beautiful uh, uh, a range bounding fault scarp that uh, again indicates that the uplift and the tilting here is relatively recent in geologic time. So, if you're interested in this sort of thing, in the southern, we won't visit the southern Reveille Range, we'll, we'll be up here in the northern part about right here. You'll be camping about right there. And we don't, you can get up in here, there's some dirt roads that lead up close and then you have to hike the rest of the way. But there was a master's thesis done in 2008 at UNLV, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I've uploaded it as part of the uh, weekly module if you're interested. Now, not only does it have all the gory details you'd ever want on an area like this, but the other reason I put it in there was for those of you who are interested or thinking about grad school, it gives you a pretty good idea of what a typical master's thesis looks like. And in there he explains what he had to do and the processes he went through. Anyway, so it's there if you are interested. I didn't work in the southern part of the range, although I did go down there periodically. Now, Another factor for these types of areas in the central part of the basin and range is, is that there are older Paleozoic rocks in the southern Reveille range and actually exposed in various places even in the center part of the range. But these older Paleozoic rocks were buried by these younger ash flows, the ignimbrites. And where you have the volcanic rocks meeting the older Paleozoic rocks, especially the carbonate rocks, this sets up a lot of fluid exchange, a lot of heat, and you get some really good mineral deposits. And across Nevada, the disseminated gold uh, and a lot of the really, really important mineral finds are there because of this later volcanic activity, igneous activity, and its interactions with the older sedimentary rocks. Here's a couple of photos from the Reveille Range. This is the old town of Reveille, or the old town site, or the old whatever it is, and uh, again, this shows that, that during the 1800s and into the early 1900s, there was plenty of gold mining in these districts that lied in the Reveille Range. Uh, you'll find uh, uh, cans and, and, and lots of old relics from these sorts of things. And then as late as the early 1980s, there was actually a functioning gold mine with heap leach pits and this is a photo from there. This is just above, uh, it takes us about 10 minutes to drive here from where we camp. Anyway, these were the pits that they would put the gold in, or the gold, the, the, the ore, and then they would leach it with cyanide. And uh, there's all these barrels of old cyanide barrels and piping and everything. Anyway, so the Reveille Range has seen some activity gold mining well into the latter part of the 20th century. Now, the name of the game in the rest of the Reveille Range is, of course, Tufts. And where we will actually camp and, and hang out, there is, is, it's, it's an area known as the Goblin Knobs Caldera, and it's filled with uh, this, something called the Monotony Tuff. Now, if you're going to be called Monotony Tuff, it means that you are very similar Right? The tuff is, doesn't change much no matter where you see it. It's, it's so thick and so widespread and there's no changes within it 
that it was called the monotony tough. And it's believed to be a caldera filling unit. So when the, when the caldera erupts, some of the material fills up the caldera as it drops down and other stuff is ejected over the sides and it becomes outflow. So anyway, this is a field trip I led years ago, um, the famous all-female uh, field trip, except me, of course. And we are in the Monotony Tough, just outside of where we camp. And there's lots and lots of joints in here. And these ladies are using the Brunton compass and identifying uh, the various jointing directions. So these lines that you see in here are not beds or anything. That's all jointing in the tufts caused by uh, later structural activity. Remember, these tufts are somewhere in the mid-25 million years old, so they've had time to get beat up a little bit. Well, I showed you this diagram early in the class, and again, I put it here because it's a, it's a nice example of showing how wide the basin and range is and the fact that the Reveille range sits just about in the center. And this is very unique because the Reveille Range, and the reason I ever went to the Reveille Range in the first place is, is the Reveille Range contains these very young, and I mean six million years and younger, so that's Pliocene, Pleistocene age. Um, and we don't see that volcanism widespread right, across the basin and range. The tufts are widespread, so starting 30 million years ago, you had up to about 20, you had widespread eruptions of ash flow tufts. But later, getting closer to now, what we see is a limitation. Remember all the cinder cones that I showed you from down here in the uh, area around Toroweep and St. George and Zion. And then we'll also see them over here on the margins of the Sierra Nevada block. But they're almost completely missing from the Central Basin Range. Well, it just so happens that the Reveille Range is one place where you see young basaltic volcanism. So back in 1987 when I graduated with my master's degree from UNLV I was hired to go look at various volcanic fields and these volcanic studies were part of a big project to look at the suitability of Yucca Mountain for the long-term storage of radioactive waste. Yucca Mountain is a fault block mountain south of the Reveille Range in the southern part of the test site and it's made out of ash flow tuff from these eruptions about oh 15 million years ago. Well very near the site of Yucca Mountain is some young vulcan volcanism and the question was, what's the likelihood this volcanism would come back and potentially erupt through the waste repository and expose the uh, surface to radioactivity? So I worked for this project. I worked at UNLV as a researcher from 1987 to 1992. In 1992, I quit, spent a year riding my motorcycle around the world, and then I went back and got my PhD at the University of Idaho. Now this publication, The Geologic Map of the Reveille Range, I published with another scientist named Mark Martin, and it was on a section of the northern Reveille Range called the Reveille Quadrangle. This map, which I'll have with us on the field trip, oops, uh, the gray areas here are all the lavas, the gray areas and the dark gray areas. So that was my responsibility. Well, on the right, you can see the whole Reveille Range. There's Highway 375 that then cuts across the northern end of the range, meets up at Warm Springs, and then this highway continues on Highway 6 that runs from Ely in the north to Tonopah, which is about 60 miles away here. Um, so what did I find out? Well, in those years, and I worked other places as well, I determined that there were two episodes of volcanism in the Reveille Range. This volcanism began about six million years ago and continued to five million years ago and it began in the south and it continued north. And so this first episode, which I named um, episode one, was about a million years in length and it um, 
uh, uh, episode one had a volume of about eight cubic kilometers and it erupted from 52 different vents around the range and it started in the south and moved to the north. Then a second episode of volcanism and I recognize the second episode of volcanism because it overlies the first but also it's got a different mineralogy. The, 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 the petrology of the rocks is different and for those of you that go with me to the range I will show you and you will be able to see the obvious difference. Anyway, episode 2 volcanism starts at about 4.7 million years ago and continued up to 3 million years ago. So there was more or less a half a million year uh, time period where nothing erupted and then it started erupting again and the episode 2 volcanism is mostly in the northern part of the range. Now the really interesting thing that I found was that between the eruption of these two uh, sets of basalts there was a very explosive eruption of trachytic volcanism which if you don't know your petrology it's like a day site if you know that word, right? So it's andesite, then it goes to dacite, then it goes to rhyolite. So trachyte is roughly a dacite, but it's more alkaline. Anyway, at about 4.3 million years ago, which is between these two, you know, roughly uh, uh, episodes, you get this explosive volcanism, which put out an ash, which put out uh, pumice and ash all over the northern part of the range. Pretty cool. Uh, that had major implications for Yucca Mountain because uh, basaltic volcanism like, like you see in Hawaii, which is kind of you know, effusive and it pours lava flows out, is a whole different animal than things that explode out, especially if you have a nuclear waste repository. All right. This is a great satellite image showing the Reveille Range in the south there's that beautiful range bounding fault along with the Kaywich range range bounding fault. Here are those young basalts in the northern part of the range. And then this, whoops, I don't know why I keep doing that this time. But um, anyway, this is the pancake range to the north, right? And the pancake range is another volcanic range um, where once the volcanism stopped in the Reveille range, it moved northward into the Pancake range and it continued all the way up until about a million years ago. So there's a volcanic field there called Lunar Crater and you can go and it's a really neat mar, uh, meaning it's just a big hole in the ground, right? And uh, where, where, where when the lavas came up, the magmas came up, they hit groundwater and basically exploded. So the Pancake range Lying to the north of the Reveille range, the volcanism continued further than the, the, the Reveille range and continued on into the Pancake range until relatively recent times geologically. Yeah, so I mentioned this earlier. Now these are two historic uh, images from my collection. Uh, back in the uh, uh, late 80s, um, I had to make a series of diagrams to inform the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on just what we were finding out here. And this diagram shows there's the, there's the Reveille Range. This is, of course, Utah and Arizona, Nevada, California. This is Yucca Mountain, the location where that arrow is pointing to. These are the basalts that lie to the south of Yucca Mountain that I pointed out on the air photo originally, right, or the Google Earth image. And here is the Reveille Range, and here is the Pancake Range. So if you look, the Pancake Range, the Reveille Range, and there's no other young basalts younger than 6 million years old in the vicinity. Look at this. All of that ash flow, but nothing continues into the recent times. It's all over here on the east or in the west. But you find recent volcanism near Yucca Mountain and you find recent volcanism down here in the northern part of Death Valley. So we felt this represented a, uh, um, you know, a, a trend of volcanism that lied from Death Valley all the way up into Lunar Crater and of course Yucca Mountain uh, uh, was also in along this trend, which meant that the risk at Yucca Mountain needed to include studies that included, you know, what was the volcanic risk here. 
This photo is a German friend of mine on one of our motorcycle trips. Um, and uh, this was, anyway, there's a, a young volcano just to prove to you that these are not things that you can't recognize. These, this is a young cinder cone, right? This, this cinder cone is believed to be as young as 10,000 years old. And back here in the background, right there, that little ridge is Yucca Mountain. So Yucca Mountain is, is only, uh, oh, about a couple few miles away from this cinder cone. Anyway, uh, one of the trips pictures taken in 1992 when we were touring America. So, I showed you this photo early in the class when we took our tour of where the class and where this thing was going to go. Here is one of the vans we used back in the day. Uh, this is an old, uh, this is a corral still used by the, uh, the um, ranchers nearby. There is a spring here. This place is called Hyde Spring. And there's a spring that they can water the cows at when it gets really dry in the summer. So this particular vantage point, you can see this 25 million year old monotony tuff, and then the unconformity and the 4 million year old episode 2 lavas right on top of them. Pretty cool. And uh, let's see, what else can we see from this photo? Oh, there is my, there's my head. So this is taken early in the morning. And again, this is looking to the west. All right. Well, not only is there really cool geology in the Reveille Range, it's also just a really nice place to go to get away from people, too. I mean, the closest ranch where the, any human is is about 20 miles away, and the closest town, which would be Tonopah, um, or Rachel, if you count that, right, at about 60 miles away. Here we're looking north. Uh, this is actually a painting. Um, this is the northern Reveille Range with some episode uh, one lavas here. And then this is the Pancake Range to the north. And the Pancake Range is given that name because it's got pretty flat lying strata. Those are ash flows up there. The other cool thing, if you're into this sort of thing, are wild mustangs. There's quite a herd of wild mustangs that live in the Reveille Range. They get good range pasture as well as the springs, right, that, that emerge. So anyway, uh, if you're lucky enough to see these guys, they're pretty skittish, but uh, we do see them sometimes. All right, well, next week, we're going to move on, talk about Mammoth Lakes and Long Valley Caldera. Now, I originally scheduled those for two different weeks, but I don't know what I was thinking. I mean, I can combine them all into one. Um, it's mostly a tale of volcanism. Uh, how the Long Valley Caldera works and the associated volcanism of the region. This is a really spectacular place. This is called Convict Lake, and we're looking west. And this is Sunrise, right? This is the Sierra Nevada mountain range. And look at all these twisted metamorphic rocks and layers in here. You know what those are? That's what's left of the Paleozoic and Mesozoic sedimentary rocks that we visited in the Grand Canyon and at Frenchman Mountain, and they've been metamorphosed, twisted, faulted, torn up, and then intruded by the Sierra Nevada granites. Hardly recognizable, but you can see the evidence of stratification and bedding, which is now maybe metamorphic foliation, but this view is really spectacular because you see the roof pendants of the Sierra Nevada mountain range as well as the granites of the Sierra Nevada. So everything that we've studied, right, is sort of based, is, is sort of present in that view. Also, you can see the beautiful U-shaped valley, right, from Pleistocene glaciation. Pretty nice place to sit and have a cup of coffee, which we will. All right, I'll see you guys next week.